Hello and welcome to the latest dev diary for Imperator Rome. So uh, we're going back to more uh, changes coming in the Pompey patch, which is again, it's coming in June, though when in June, who knows yet. So uh, yeah, let's just get into it. So hello and welcome to another developer diary for the free Pompey update. This time we'll talk about the new benefits of playing tall and also discuss changes to barbarians, slaves and much more. Trade changes, first off. We've done some changes to trade that may not seem that impactful to you at a glance, but gives us more tools in making the game deeper and more flavorful. We've removed the sources of easy trade routes in all provinces, as it was too powerful. And uh, just to show you what he means by that, um, he means this. Basically, free trade giving you plus one province import routes. Um, so every single province you own gets an extra import route. Uh, generally, I feel like this is very useful early on, uh, but generally I tend to go with transaction taxation once you have a lot of trade routes. Um, but yeah, making that a little bit less powerful, probably a good idea. Um, it was a no-brainer to always go for those, and they made for a huge snowball of trade. We also made trade entirely handled as a provincial activity and not a city activity. So the way it works right now is that all the trade that happens within a province, all of that gets split between every city in that province and then it counts it as the city's income. So say you've got 10 cities and for the trade you're making from that province uh, is say 10 ducats, then that 10 ducats is split between those 10 cities to make it one ducat each city. And now it's just on the provincial level and you can check the amount of money you're making on the provincial level. And that just makes viewing what you're making better. It makes it easier, more readable, I guess. Um, yeah, it's a good change, it's a good change. While each city provides some commerce from its citizens, the income from commerce is handled at a provincial level. So you can see the income from a trade route at the one place it happens. Yeah, like I said, just making all the information easier to read. I like it. We removed the hard-coded benefits on a trade that were going to be exported, and instead we have two unique modifiers, increases the value of your foreign imports and your foreign exports. The economic policy for commerce is now used whether you want the strength of your benefits from exports or your benefits from imports. So, I'm wondering if the benefits on a trade that were going to be exported, is he just talking about the money here or is he talking about the modifiers? I'm leaning towards the money, right? I don't think they're gonna get rid of the modifiers like um, Papyrus giving research benefits. I don't think that's going away. Um, but having it change the money around, I mean, he could word this a bit better just to give us more of an idea on what it actually means, but I believe that that's probably right. That, uh, you know, your income and your ex ex exports, income and your expenditure, I guess. But it's not really expenditure, your imports and your exports, let's just go with that. Um, yeah, there's going to be uh, money coming in and money going out, and you can choose whether to um, basically strengthen the benefits of your imports or your exports. And, you know, that makes sense. If you want to be a really export-focused nation, you uh, get some... Your, your economic policy should be to prioritize that. Whereas if you are importing a lot, then you would prioritize that. It just depends on, you know, I guess how large your nation is. If you've got a really large nation, you're going to have an awful lot of potential trade goods to trade away. And therefore, you'd want to be on export focus. But if you're a very small nation, then you're probably going to want to be on the import focus, as long as you can get more trade routes, of course. Yeah, no, it seems it seems decent. Okay. Uh, improving your provinces. One of the problems we identified was the lack of options at times for playing tall, and you had too many resources that you had no use for when you were not busy conquering. Now, we have added four new provincial level abilities. They each cost 400 power of its given type, and it starts a process that two years later will give you a permanent bonus to that province. These can then be repeated as much as you like, but you can only have one province, sorry, one process going on in a province at a time. Uh, I feel like he's, he's kind of misreading what people are playing or what people are doing, um, because you, you have too many resources that you had no use for when you're not busy conquering. I find that I have 
other than religious, which is useless mana, um, you generally find that you get most of your points while you're busy conquering. In a big war at the end of it, you've probably got a lot of mana uh, because you're not, you know, waiting for your truces or your aggressive expansion to decay and therefore you're spending your mana instead. But that, that's kind of beside the point. So what do we have? We've got Install Provincial Pur Procurators. So for 400 military power, you can increase 2% population output and 0.01 monthly province loyalty. And this will be going on until the end of the game. Okay, um, I don't think I'm ever gonna spend military points on that, but okay. Promote infrastructure spending, uh, 400 civic power for an extra building slot. Yeah, no, no, never gonna use that either. Entice building investments, 400 oratory power for one import route. Um, this one is, this is the, I guess this is the best one of the lot because I don't know whether I'll use it or not, if that makes sense. So oratory is by far the most valuable of your mana points, in my opinion, um, in a lot of people's opinions. And so you don't really want to be spending 400 at a time, but if it gives you plus one import route until the end of the game, that's very powerful. Plus one import route is, well, a duck in a month, give or take, depending on how, uh, you know, the, the new changes are going to go. Uh, but say right now, about a ducat a month and whatever bonus you get from importing it, is that worth 400 oratory power? Maybe, M maybe, maybe not, maybe, I don't know. And I guess I don't know is probably the best case scenario, you don't want to make it a, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to do this right now, all the time, every time, because it's so good. But at the same time, you don't want it to be, I'm never going to use this, like these. Uh, and then make religious endowments, religious power, 400 of which, for 3% state religion happiness in a province. And I see this being probably the one that is on the opposite scale to these two, uh, where I'm probably going to do this one quite often. Uh, because at the moment, your religion is not that important. Um, like, it's, what, I think, uh, negative 5 or is it negative 10% happiness for having the wrong religion? Uh, but if you have the right religion, I, that's, that's not a huge difference. But if you keep making these religious endowments, then you're going to find that your guys are going to be very, very happy even if they're the wrong culture. Um, because there's a lot of territory on the map that has your religion, but a foreign culture. Think of Gaul, the amount of different cultures in Gaul, but they're all Druidic. And so is Britain. And so is much of Iberia. So that could work out very well. Similarly, similarly, I hate that word. Similarly, uh, Rome, and Sicily, and Etruria, and Macedon, and Thrace, and Athens are all Hellenic. And yet they are vastly different cultures. Uh, even, you know, being wrong culture groups in some cases, like the Hellenic culture group with Sicily, and then the Latin culture group with Rome. Uh, so having them be a lot happier because of, well, I mean, it's not a lot, but it's it adds up if you want to spend 400 of a useless mana point to, you know, make them happier. I can, I can see that working out. I can see that being quite useful. Whether it's 400 power useful, uh, it depends if you've got a really good, or I guess a really zealous ruler. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to wait and see. I, again, I don't like that it's more, hey, we've given you more uses for mana instead of, a, we've removed mana from the game, but, you know, gotta, gotta go with what we've given, right? So, moving on. There are also ways to do these state investments other than spending lots of power. Oh, good. Uh, there are events and decisions, like country forming, that will give you an amount of free slots... For, sorry, free state investments, which is then used instead of the power cost. 
Great. Just make sure everyone has a country to form then. Like, everyone. Not just some. Everyone needs a country to form. The only ones I can see not being able to form a country is like, maybe Rome? Other than that, I can't think of a nation that shouldn't be able to form a country. Um, and, for example, I've got this game here. This is the community multiplayer game, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get rid of the cropping just for this. Um, I started as Syracuse, then I formed Sicily, and now I am Magna Graecia. I formed two countries as Sicily. Um, so that would give me, you know, a certain amount of extra provincial policies, I guess they're called. Um, but then there's countries that can't form anything, like the aforementioned Rome. Um, Sparta can only form Arcadia. I'm, I think they can probably form Argead Empire. But just think, to form the Argead Empire, he, he's going to need to conquer all the way over to here. It's, it's very, very unbalanced. Th these bonuses seem quite powerful. And yeah, I mean, some countries, like there's some countries in Gaul, their only formable nation is the one that needs them to conquer land here, which is just, just insane. It's, it's so dumb. But yeah, I think more formable nations need to be a thing. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. Events and decisions. I mean, I like events and I like decisions, so having them be things that happen more often would be great. Uh, country forming, just need more of them. But yeah, we'll see how it goes. There are also three different abilities you can do in each city, so on the, on the smallest level. Move capital. Yay, finally. First of all, you can move your capital to that city for a large cost of civic power, uh, where it becomes cheaper to move to a bigger city and more expensive to move to a smaller city. Great. Good, that's fine, totally fine with that. Um, yay, power cost, Blah, I hate that word. Um, relocate provincial capital. You can change which city is the capital city of a province for 50 civic power. Uh, funnily enough, he doesn't say anything about, you know, becoming cheaper to move to a bigger city or anything. Uh, provincial, sorry, province capitals will be set at the start of the game and will only change otherwise if conquered by another nation. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. The problem we have in the current version of the game, if I just open Imperator once more, and look at, say, this province here, right? If I was at war with Etruria, and he came down and he sieged my land down here, and he absolutely wrecked this province here of uh, Scipius, and he killed, well, I, I guess we could just go with like, you know, four or five. If he killed five pops, um, the capital would change, and it would change, in this case, to Cancian. So, okay, he goes to Cancian, and he, he sieges that too, but he kills some more pops. So the provincial capital moves to Ascalon. So he sieges Ascalon, and oh, he's killed some more, so it moves to Nakravnia. So he has to go all the way out down here and siege Nakravnia as well. And at this point, it probably, I mean, it could even switch back to Scipius. Um, at that point, but now, at the start of the game, uh, every province is going to have a capital. Say in this province, it might even be Scipius, and it will stay there unless it is conquered, not just occupied, but conquered by another nation. That will prevent, you know, having to move around and snipe capitals again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Perfect. Great change. Great change. Uh, coordinate urban development. Pay 100 civic power. No. Uh, to start a process, at the end of two years' time, you'll get plus one local civilization in that city until the end of the game. This can be repeated as much as you want, but you can't do it more than once in a city at the same time. Yeah, never going to do that. Moving on. Right. I would like to look at this because this shows the... Uh, the new province screen, and it is bigger. It is certainly bigger. It's got this extra bit on the top. So what have we got? Uh, we have the four new buttons. We have a much easier to read provincial loyalty bar. I like this, you know, having the arrows here showing if the loyalty is going up or down is much, much better. 
um, a culture and a religion uh, pie chart is perfect. Although I would like to also see actual percentages and then also a pie chart breakup of the pop types. Perfect, I like that. Uh, then we've got the tax income right here. We've got the commerce income right here. Uh, I guess this is move, make capital city, make provincial city. Uh, yeah, I can't see much wrong with this. I assume this button down here is the one that we've just talked about, coordinate urban development. Um, and I can't see anything else at this present time. But yeah, no, this is a much much better um, situation for the for the province screen. I do wish um, I want to know what this is. This is a drop down menu. So what is hidden beneath this? Well, I mean it's it's a big ass button, but what's hidden beneath this arrow? I want to know. Buildings have changed with the population rework mentioned earlier, and by the trade rework mentioned today. So marketplaces now have plus 10% tax income from the city. Training camps give plus 10% manpower. Fortresses give plus one fort level and granaries give plus five population capacity. Um, so well, let's read this bit first. Now, some of these changes will make you go, what the fuck? Uh, I'd like to point out that granaries don't just give plus five pop capacity in most cases, as there are modifiers like grain giving plus 10 adjacent to major river plus 50, warm climate plus 90, etc. or etc. So, okay, fair enough. Uh, let's have a look at the game currently to see what the buildings currently do, and so we can just compare. So, marketplaces are currently, or are going to be, just plus 10% taxes. So if we check random city, marketplaces give 5% tax, 5% commerce, and some local civ level. So as we know, the commerce income has now changed to being a provincial modifier, so that makes sense to get rid of that there. Taxes have been doubled, but it's lost the civilization level. So I guess that makes it harder for barbarians or, or tribals, I guess, um, to civilize because, yeah, that was a pretty, that was the best way of boosting your civ level is just get your cities to be absolutely chock full of like slaves or even promote them if you want and then build all the marketplaces you can like I've done down here in Sikulia, sorry, in Serakuzai. Almost got 100 pops and I've got 10 marketplaces. So yeah, no, uh, it's a bit different, it's a bit different. All right, next one. Looking at training camps, plus 10% manpower. And at the moment, it's plus 10% manpower. Nothing has changed. Fort levels also hasn't changed. And now granaries are now plus 5% pop capacity, uh, changed from population growth and slave happiness. So, yeah, slave happiness is completely gone, it seems, and pop growth... Oh, I, did. I feel like it hasn't really changed. Maybe the, the amount has changed, but pop growth and pop capacity, I feel, is probably the same. Say if you have a really high pop capacity, I think your pops are probably going to grow faster. And... Yeah, I don't feel that this one has changed, other than the slave happiness, of course. I don't feel this has changed that much. Um, I'm just going to have to figure out, uh, with maths and shit, which I'm not going to do, uh, what local pop growth plus 0.06% would translate to in population capacity. Because, honestly, I don't know. I really don't. But we'll see, we'll see. Also, of course, I'm using a, a mod, because why wouldn't I? Uh, so this isn't what, obviously, the, the game would look like. For, uh, for you if you don't have a modded game. So apologies for that one. Uh, all right, well, uh, going back to the Dev Diary, we have the Barbarian Rework. A lot of things regarding Barbarians work similar to how they did in the original EU Rome, and that was just not good enough anymore. Is that right how they did in the EU Rome? I think this, just on its own, should be a quote right now. Uh, in Pompey, you will now see the following changes to Barbarians. Paid off barbarians will no longer loot your territory. It was fucking insane that they did. So yeah, that just makes all of the sense because that was kind of the point. That was why you paid the bastards off in the first place. Ay -ay -ay. Uh, barbarians that have not fought in a battle will never accept surrender. Eh, okay. 
Uh, barbarians will no longer care about potential strength when you negotiate with them, only about armies in the same general area. The fact he didn't mention province or uh, region and instead went with general area uh, makes me think it is a distance calculation. Um, I guess that makes more sense than either of the other two, because if you're on the border of a province or a border of a, a region, depending on which one it would have been, um, then they wouldn't be counted. Or it could even be within two regions or within a region and a bit. I don't, I'm not sure. But yeah, no, I think it's probably a distance thing. Uh, barbarians are no longer clever enough to use zone control propagation even if they do take a fort. So that means that, you know, when you have sieged a fort, uh, the fort will siege all adjacent provinces, unless they're uh, protected by a fort. Actually, no, not if they're not protected by a fort, because sometimes you see it where they will basically swap possession of a city, and they'll just get resieged and resieged and resieged, because of course. Uh, but yeah, no, this is uh, this is good. That's fine. Barbarians no longer have any attrition in unowned provinces. Uh, good. Uh, that was most clear, for me at least, uh, here. So if we go to the barbarian thing, you see the barbarians spawn here. And by the time they have walked through these four provinces with their really trash supply, uh, they get to this province and there's very few of them left. So yeah, it makes, makes sense. That's, yeah, I'm fine with that. Absolutely fine with that. And then barbarians will reinforce twice as quick when not sieging, fine. Uh, barbarians will now grow in size as they take over provinces containing tribesmen. That's pretty cool, I like that. Um, because then you can get your barbarian horde problem just to spiral out of control if you don't deal with it quickly enough, or if your armies just aren't in the region at the time. Um, yeah, no, I like it, that's, I like it, it's good. Uh, now, zone of control changes. There's also been two major advantages to friendly zone of control in Pompey. First of all, they now protect against the nasty things barbarians do in your territory. Oh, fuck yes, thank you. <laughs> That's, oh, gone. I mean, the, the fact that it didn't was a shock to me. Uh, but yeah, protecting against native 10 civilization is a great thing and means that I will have forts on the borders with barbarians even if they don't, you know, if they can choose which province they go to, like, yeah, no, that's good, that's good. Um, you know, if I even show you, so say you had barbarian, oh, you've got rid of all your barbarians. You good boy. All right, well, there used to be barbarians in, like, this province here, and it was annoying that I had to have forts on every single one of these because... Otherwise, they would just come out from uh, these hills. God damn it, show me a better map mode. I don't have a better map mode. They'd come from this hill, and they'd choose whichever one they wanted to go to. And then they'd siege it, and it would lose all their civilization value, which means that the, the barbarian stronghold here would be even more powerful the next time. Uh, but now you can have it so that you only choose, you know, maybe um, this hill province, and then... Uh, this province and you know, so every province would be covered by a fort But you wouldn't have to have forts in every single one uh, To protect it. So yeah, that's a, another great change. I like it All right, and uh, bu -bu 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 -bum. But most importantly friendly zone of control now protects against the attrition you get from bad climate. Oh Thank you. Oh, thank you. That is huge that is ridiculously, most awesomely, perfectly awesome, yes, please, thank you. All right, so basically, if you have not played somewhere like Armenia, uh, every winter, give or take, you would get snow, snowing on, you know, the northern part of your country, and no matter if you stood on a province with 10 times the amount of supply limit as the army that was there, it would take 1% attrition for normal winter, 2% uh, attrition for severe winter, and there would be nothing you could do about it. Absolutely nothing, other than move your troops to a province that, or a city that didn't have, um, you know, winter in it. And there being no winter map mode certainly didn't help matters, because you'd have to change to the terrain map mode, uh, or, yeah, the terrain map mode to, you know, see where, which provinces are whiter than others. 
it was infuriating, and this makes it so much better. I like it. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bum, where are we now? This makes it so you don't lose half your army before because you live in a desert, nor will you take a huge hit every single winter as a German tribesman. Uh, yeah, deserts as well. Oh, so good, so good. All right, slave distribution. Oh God, thank you. Uh, we did some changes to slave distribution in Pompey in that each time you take a city, the amount of possible cities getting slaves are far larger and not weighted towards 50% reaching your capital. Now it will consider more provinces the bigger your nation is, good, and also add in ports. Fantastic! That is a great addition. And not just provincial capitals and cities where the commander has holdings, etc., et to get a better spread. Just the fact that they've added, for one, uh, ports, and two, where the commander has holdings, especially with holdings being more of a thing in Pompey, apparently. Um, yeah, no, this is this is fantastic. This is fantastic. This stops the problem where your capital has like 300 slaves and to fix the inevitable slave revolt or food crisis, you would have to spend just buttloads of civic power, which is just not what anyone wants to do. So yeah, that's a, that's a great change as well. And now on to heritages. One of the biggest complaints we had with the release was man sorry, was nations felt the same. While we had a wide variety of countries with different populations and governments, there needed to be a bit more to identify them. Even if any city state on Crete would have had a great number of similarities with any other city states on the same island, there were also differences. Mostly I felt those differences came down to trade goods. Uh, but mostly, for me at least, the change came down to which one had the nicer flag. And therefore, I didn't play with Nosos, because Nosos has a terrible flag. Uh, this is why we're adding heritages to the Pompey update. A heritage has two benefits and one drawback, uh, so to give a sort of identity to your country. There are a dozen generic, sorry, there are a dozen different generic heritages that depend on your geographical position. For instance, you would get a seafaring heritage if you start with a port, and a desert heritage if your capital has desert terrain. Over 20 countries will have unique heritages in Pompey, and we'll keep adding more in future patches. Some are for powers that have had their glory days behind them, while others are for countries that would rise to become influential in the future. As an example here are some that we've added for Egypt, Carthage, Syracuse, and Athens. So, heritage for Egypt, we, and I believe this also changes depending on what you choose with the whole shall I be Macedonian or Egyptian, should I be Hellenic or um, Kemetic? I think. I'm not certain on that one. Uh, but anyway, get national population growth as if they need it with the amount of grain they have. State religion happiness plus 10%. Yeah, no, no. I mean, if you're staying Macedonian, uh, there's not a whole lot of state religion, but okay. And then diplomatic reputation negative 2, which is not a big drawback in my opinion. Um, however, I think this is something we're going to go back to. Carthaginian heritage, export value plus 10%, navy maintenance cost minus 10%, and loyalty gain chance plus 5%. Uh, loyalty gain chance, uh, this could end up biting you in the ass, uh, but at the same time, um, having loyal troops gives you more discipline on said troops, so it's a double-edged sword with this one. So yeah, this these two are very, very good especially naval maintenance cost for Carthage. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a big drawback. That's a, definitely a bigger drawback than Diplo Rep. Um, but then I think export value and naval maintenance cost is more valuable than these two, so we'll see. Syracusan heritage, mercenary maintenance, negative 10%. Ships damage taken, negative 5%. And national citizen happiness, negative 5%. I hate this. I, I am glad that I'm playing Syracuse right now. Because honestly, with these heritages, or with this heritage, I probably wouldn't pick them. Uh, because this is more painful than either of these. This is okay-ish, uh, but still naval maintenance cost is worth more, in my opinion. And then mercenary maintenance is less valuable than any of these. So it has something worse, something worse, and something worse than the others it's it's definitely not balanced i mean i'm not i'm not asking for a hundred percent balance but you, you gotta make it so that it's 
appealing, right? Anyway, uh, Athenian heritage, negative 5% morale of armies. Um, it's kind of a toss up which one of these is more valuable. I'm, I think, sorry, which one is, is uh, more painful? And I, to be honest, I think maybe citizen happiness is still more painful. Monthly tyranny going down. I mean, I generally don't have all that much tyranny, so eh. And then endorsed party cost. Eh. I mean, I guess these two definitely work together because endorsing a party gives you tyranny and then your tyranny is going to go away faster. So I guess this definitely is, is flavorful, I guess. It works together. Uh, negative morale of armies is sucky, but Athens is probably going to have really good tech and you get morale from tech. So eh, it's okay, I guess. Um, and yeah, that's the end of the dev diary. Uh, we also have this. Uh, I don't know how making trade on a provincial level instead of a city level encourages city building and tall getting play, to be honest. I like to have it on a city level to see how the city rolls with the rest in the massive income, to which Johan replied, it didn't. The trade income was split between each city in the province, and that's basically what I said earlier. And then a Hottest Rod is saying that uh, the release date is sometime in June. So this has been a, a bloody long video, probably because I've had a few tangents opening the, uh, the game, uh, but... I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, for me personally, this is iffy. This is pretty great. Apart from this, this is pretty shit. Um, this is fine. Uh, this is fantastic. And these are all great. Apart from heritages are hit and miss. But yeah, I would love to know what you think. So please do let me know in the comment section down below. And I will see you guys in uh, the next one. Bye-bye for now.